through all of the, the, the possible sentences these folks might get, uh, you know, it added up to some you know, hundreds of years. So I guess when you look at the big picture and you find out that Jennifer uh, Rosenbaum received 50 years, uh, a life sentence plus 50 years, maybe that sounds uh, worse than it could have been. I don't know. Uh, and, and Joseph, who a lot of folks thought might kind of get off a little easier, certainly found guilty by association, if nothing else. And he got uh, uh, 30 years in prison, but a 50, 50 year sentence, 30 of that in prison, 20 of it on probation. Uh, again, some of these things may be subject to parole at an earlier date. But the bottom line is uh, uh, these are some hefty sentences. The jury certainly finding that the treatment of little Layla Marie Daniel and uh, her sister Millie uh, just could not have been worse and of course ended up with the death of Layla Marie. I have three guests with me right now and I'm going to start first of all I have Judge Ashley Wilcott, I have Brad Milklin and I also have uh, Joseph Tully who's hanging around for a little drive-by. Thanks for sticking around for a little bit. Let me start with you Joseph. Uh, surprised by these verdicts? Um, about right? What do you think? Well I'm surprised in that the, the jury gave it a lot of thought. It wasn't substantial guilty across all all counts it was guilty of some things not guilty of the other things but for all intents and purposes uh all the major stuff that really mattered they were guilty so um, yeah well, sorry joseph i lost you a little bit there let me ask you brad while you're sitting here uh, same same question what are your thoughts on the verdict uh surprise well, it was a little surprising when they first started to read it, because if you listen to the whole thing, which was a little painstaking, at first there was a lot of not guilties, and you thought, well, maybe they're going to walk until they hit the aggravated assault, the felony murder, and then it went downhill. Um, I was surprised it even went to trial. Given the nature and amount of charges, there was no chance with a dead baby that they were going to walk. I just can't believe they took it this far anyway. Judge Ashley, let me ask you this, because it gets to that core issue that we're certainly going to see on appeal, and that is one attorney representing both of these defendants. There was definitely some uh, guilt by association, I'm calling it, some blow-by. When Jennifer Rosenbaum was really the target of all the actions, and Joseph seemed to be the guy who never stopped what happened. Uh, right. So yeah, I mean, how, how bad is this? going to be on appeal. It's going to be a mess, don't you think? Well, I definitely think that's an issue they're going to raise on appeal. And I do agree with you. You know, if you listen to this trial, the testimony was really directed at her as the foster mother, not at him, because she was <laughs> present, he wasn't. And I do think the obvious grounds for appeal in this case are the fact that they were represented by the same attorney. Yeah, and, and, you know, again, we don't know what the jury did with that. We don't know how they would handle two of these cases separately, but I know that and there's at least a chance we're going to find out if the uh, appeal goes through as we expect, at least on that one issue. Okay, we're going to take a uh, look now at some of the testimony from earlier in that trial. Uh, this is from, uh, this was the sentencing phase. Remember, after the guilt uh, was decided, there were statements made. Some people uh, appeared before the court to give their thoughts. Let's listen to this. This is the latest mother. Clearly uh, a powerful moment there for the biological mother of Layla to give the court uh, her thoughts on what should happen in the sentencing phase of this trial. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have to imagine there's some serious guilt there, not just, uh, you know, pain over the loss of the daughter, but hey, you know, if I hadn't had the drug issues and didn't have to put them in foster program, hey, who knows what would or would not have happened. So let's look now at the sentencing itself after the judge heard these many statements. Let's go back to court for that. As I hear the judge lay out these numbers, especially for Joseph, I it just, I don't know, my gut just says something's wrong. That that's just, th that, that what he didn't do, which is the, the, the key to the charges against him, what he didn't do in stopping Jennifer Rosenbaum from injuring that child or ultimately killing that child, I don't know. Uh, so we're going to take a quick break. We're going to listen to what Joseph's parents had to say prior to the sentencing, because I think it expresses some of the feelings many might have uh, in seeing how he was connected to this case. So let's take a quick break here at the Long Crime Network. We will be right back. Well, you can, you can hear and see how torn up the father of Joseph Rosenbaum is. And as I sit here, and as I'm sure many people watching this trial sat here, they're thinking that maybe Joseph gets, uh, you know, the proverbial slap on, on the wrist. Brad Micklin, trial attorney from New Jersey, is here with me on set. Simple question for you, Brad. Does he get a better sentence, a better deal, less time if he's tried separately? I think so. Well, also, he could sit there and, and point the finger. He could also plea and get a, a much favorable plea agreement. So he had a lot of options that I, I don't know exactly how or why they were waived or even if they were waived, but he would have done much better on his own. Yeah. I, I mean, the way, the way I always looked at it was, you know, here's his defense. Right. You know, Judge Ashley, uh, what do you think? Uh, you know, um, the judge ultimately has to make a decision based on what the attorney represents is her client's wishes. So uh, how did that process <clears throat> unfold in this case? 
exactly what happens. So that attorney has to make a determination if there's a conflict or not, as you well know. And if there is, then she has to advise the client who can always waive the conflict. But that information, I'm certain when you have two defendants, especially in a case as um, horrific as this one, they absolutely, the judge is going to go through that to make certain they either say there's no conflict or if there is that it's waived so they can continue with one attorney representing both. Now, the other thing, I'll just play devil's advocate. Perhaps the attorney thought there were there wasn't a lot of risk to the foster father because, quite frankly, there wasn't as much evidence as to him. He literally wasn't there. Nobody alleged he was there at the time this happened. So it may have been thought, well, there's not a lot of risk representing both. Yeah, you know, I, I get that. And let me ask you, uh, Joseph, uh, is that kind of the, it's almost like a do or die approach there. We both did nothing, therefore, how can it, you know, bleed over onto Joseph? Yes, absolutely. It, it, it could have been the client's wishes to be tried together. It could have been the husband saying, no, I am with my wife. We are not guilty. We are in this together. And, and I could see, I've always looked at the, the, the mug shots and said, okay, who's running the show in this case? You could tell from the mug shots that, you know, Jennifer was definitely running the show. And maybe this is just another example of the dynamic between Jennifer and Joseph Rosenbaum, that uh, she called the shots and he, uh, you know, went along with it. Okay, the judge had something to say after these statements made, especially the statement by Michael Rosenbaum, Joseph's father. Let's listen to that. And with that, Jennifer and Joseph Rosenbaum cuffed and left the building uh, on their way to serve out some mighty sentences. Life uh, for uh, Jennifer with decades and then uh, 50 years, 30 of which in prison for Joseph. Uh, again, with my guest, uh, let me start with Joseph Tully. Uh, you know, does the judge need to make these kinds of comments? What's the point? Is it to make a record? Is it to cover his butt? I mean, what's the reason? Uh, it's actually pretty typical. The judge is trying to protect the integrity of the jury's verdict. And so the, the father got up there and did something human and wanted to shift the blame away from his son and just start saying, hey, if the birth parents hadn't taken drugs and alcohol, this would have never happened. And while it might be a human thing to do, as a defense attorney, I was cringing as the father was doing that. So the judge has to come out and defend the integrity of the process and the integrity of people who uh, are victims in the case, the birth parents, you know, their children are dead now and they're victims and the, and the judge is merely uh, protecting that. So, Judge uh, Ashley Wilcott, you've, you've been on the bench. You've heard defendants make a plea for uh, for their own safety, their own lesser sentence. You've heard relatives make those pleas. Didn't surprise me to hear Joseph's dad blame the birth parents. So, you know, how do you handle that kind of information? Well, I think that it's a not surprising. I would agree with you. And, you know, whoever speaks on behalf of defendants or on behalf of victims always has their own personal bias, so to speak, right? They love that person they're speaking on behalf of. They care about that person. And they bring all of that to the table and say everything they want to. And that's what our system is designed to do with these statements at sentencing. So courts, judges listen to all of that. But it doesn't mean we agree with what they may say. We may disagree and then have that opportunity again to clarify this is the system the jury did convict and this is where we are. So let me ask you, Brad, uh, these parents of Joseph primarily, I think they're going to have to channel that energy, that anger somewhere or it's going to eat them up. You, I really think they were very surprised, if not by the guilty uh, verdict, but certainly by the sentencing. Thoughts? I agree. And it's, you know, of course, they're going to get up and plead for their son and, and push the blame. I don't think the judge really should have gone and made all the statements. There's no good comes from that. Not that it would be considered evidence or reversible error. But when you're looking at a case where you have such a gravity of an offense, you have obviously the appeal issues that are going to follow. I think he should have just left it alone and, and just done the sentencing. Joseph, I'm going to have to let you go. So let me give you another shot here. Let me give you one, uh, one last thought or two. Um, as the appeal moves forward, we fully expect that it will. We know that the conflict of counsel will be certainly one of those issues. You followed the trial. Any other big appellate points that you think might be raised? I, I don't know that anything surpasses the, the glaring issue that, as you noted earlier, the, the husband in this case, Joseph, uh, needed a defense attorney screaming, separating him from his wife, from the actions of his wife, pointing out that he had nothing to do with this. He was not home at the time. 
And the fact that that didn't happen will no doubt, uh, per, you know, be a big point on appeal. Yeah, that'll be the bold face. There might be others. You always throw everything in, but that'll definitely be the bold uh, capital letters there. Hey, I'm going to let you go, Joseph Tully. Thank you for sticking around for a little time this yeah. afternoon with me. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. You take bet. Care. We'll see you next time. Okay, guys, let's take a quick break. We'll come back uh, more on the other side on this case and others. This is the Long Prime Network.